Hello and welcome to our special show Living Long and Healthy with COVID vaccination. This show seeks to address any concerns, any doubts that you may, you may have regarding the vaccines for coronavirus because remember the risk of the COVID infections continues, cases are rising and the vaccination is the only way that you can protect yourself. It's the only way we're going to end this pandemic. We have experts with us to address all your questions and concerns. Today we're joined by Dr. Abdul Hamid Zargar, former director, Sherry Kashmir Institute of Medical Science. Sciences Srinagar and Dr. Manjinder Sandhu, Director Cardiology and Artemis Cardiac Care Private Limited at Artemis Hospitals at Guru Gram. Thank you so much, uh, doctors, for taking time out and joining us and you know answering all these questions that we have. Uh, Dr. Uh, Abdul, I'd like to start with you. And uh, does the vaccine protect against the new variants of coronavirus? Because that's the big news right now about how the variants have also spread in the country. I must tell you, when you look at a pandemic of this magnitude that has lasted for such a long time, mutations are not all that uncommon otherwise also in viruses. Now today, as you very rightly said, globally we have many uh, mutants uh, that have been identified. We have UK mutant, we have Brazil mutant, we have um, South African mutant and we have now certain mutations identified in our own country. My fundamental belief is when you look at all the vaccines that are available today, most of them in the clinical trials have shown an efficacy of 70 to 90, 94, 95 percent. My personal belief is that given the efficacy of these vaccines, most likely they are also going to impact many of these mutants as well. It has already been shown that Pfizer's vaccine also impacts Brazil and um, UK variant and if uh, even the AstraZeneca vaccine they are evaluating now again it's South African variant, uh, UK variant. But the fundamental lesson is one, I my take on this thing is that in a similar fashion the way we have seen in clinical trials on so called now routine COVID-19 uh, COVID virus the efficacy of 70-90% is most likely that either one type of a vaccine or a combination of these vaccines would definitely be able to help majority of these mutant uh, COVID-19 uh, virus variations as well. Basic fundamental point is that given the current scenario the mantra for taking care of this global epidemic, global pandemic is get vaccinated as many people as possible and get them vaccinated as soon as logistically possible. All right. Now, uh, Dr. Sandhu, uh, can one still transmit COVID after vaccination? Because this is something that we're warned about. We're asked to continue following COVID protocols. So if you could explain this. Well, getting vaccinated is very much like wearing a bulletproof vest. It will protect you from grievous injury but you could still get hurt. Similarly, after you take vaccine, the chances of your getting COVID infection are very low, but they do exist. And even if you get the COVID infection, the chances that the illness will turn into something serious are almost non-existent. Regarding the question about ability to transmit the infection, theoretically, yes. But we must remember that the viral loads are responsible for the ability to transmit the infection. And viral loads in people who have been vaccinated and get the COVID infection are four to five times lower than the viral loads in the patients who get COVID who are unvaccinated. And naturally, uh, the question that whether you can stop wearing masks after you are vaccinated, well, the answer is no. All right, uh, Dr. Abdul, now uh, if we talk about uh, diabetes, are women more prone to COVID during gestational diabetes? Fundamentally, you know, when we talk about gestational diabetes, we talk about two things. One, pregnancy, because the gestational diabetes is a diabetes that for the first time is diagnosed during pregnancy. Now, pregnant women, the way the body adjusts to this pregnancy is having many changes in their immunological system and physiological system that predisposes these women to respiratory infections including viral infections, so including COVID-19 uh, infection. Now, as such, as you must have, you have heard over the last one year, uh, if you look at obesity, uh, the chances of mortality, morbidity high, if you look at diabetes, hypertension, 
chance of morbidity and mortality high. In these young women, because pregnancy would occur in young women predominantly, unless an IVF is done in a relatively older lady, uh, where GDM would be very high, this adds another layer of susceptibility having this diabetes. The third concern invariably in uh, most people's minds would be that when you have pregnancy, uh, when you have uh, gestational diabetes, which I told you adds another layer of susceptibility, and then you develop COVID, what happens to fetus? There was a good paper published in JAMA Pediatrics last year, and I'm sure there must be some recent data also available now. Uh, we showed that predominantly the infection does not get transmitted in uh, the womb, in the utero. But few cases of uh, neonatal COVID-19 uh, were uh, diagnosed, uh, whether they got it after the delivery or not. But uh, all of them cleared their virus in a relatively brief period of two weeks. So that uh, the basic question is that treat the disease well. If you diagnose gestational diabetes, ensure that your patient remains in a good blood sugar control throughout the pregnancy to minimize the chance of one, getting COVID-19 and two, getting a poor outcome because of that COVID-19. Dr. Sandhu, uh, people who are a heart patient, is there anything that they need to look out for after they get the vaccine? Uh, well, um, as heart patients, they need not look out for something specific after they get vaccinated. They may experience pain at the injection site, fever, body aches, just like the others. But there is one thing. Most of the heart patients are on so-called blood thinners. The blood thinners are basically, um, uh, you know, there's no drug which thins your blood, uh, but they are mainly of two types. One is what we call as the antiplatelet agents. There's, those are the Ecosprin and, uh, you know, Clopidogrel and uh, Brilinta, Tricagrelor, and anticoagulant agents, which are Acetrom, Warfarin, Eliquis, Zarelto, etc., now, antiplatelet agents make uh, the, the platelets in the body, uh, you know, make it difficult for them to stick together. So that these are the ones which we commonly call as the blood thinners, the aspirin. So as long as you're taking these, there's nothing to be stopped and you can safely go ahead with the vaccination. People who are taking anticoagulants, uh, that is acetrum and warfarin, can also safely take the injection intramuscularly, but there may be a little bit of bruising around the injection site. And uh, I would feel that you should consult the cardiologist if you're any, on any of these blood thinners. Maybe if the indication for which you were prescribed them, uh, he may be able to stop it for a couple of days before you get vaccinated. Or uh, he may ask you to get a you know, blood test done like the INR, which if it is above the therapeutic range, then he may ask you to stop it for a couple of days. Other than that, there's nothing specific that the heart patients need to look at once they're getting vaccinated. All right. Uh, Dr. Abdul, if we come back to people with diabetes, is there any special care that they need to take any special precautions on the day they go in for their vaccines? Or do they need to consult their doctor about adjusting any of their medications? We have routinely advised all patients with diabetes to get vaccinated. And uh, every time, you know, we tell them that just come here, come, uh, come to our center. See, everybody here has got already vaccinated. We, vac we vaccinated ourselves first. And, uh, but you know, a lot of, uh, sometimes this uh, media is not that affectionate to too much uh, ne negative news comes in. Uh, but I think, you know, when it comes from a credible professional source, uh, people do listen and uh, people do get vaccinated. All right, well, uh, we'll slip into a short break now and uh, we're answering all your questions, all your doubts regarding uh, the vaccinations for coronavirus. And, uh, and on the other side of this break, we'll ask some more questions regarding how safe the vaccines are. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching our special program, Living Long and Healthy with COVID Vaccination. We're answering all your doubts and questions about uh, the vaccines, and we have doctors with us uh, taking those questions. Uh, Dr. Sandhu, I'd like to ask you, are people with a history of heart disease and risk factors like a concurrent a hypertension and obesity safe for the vaccination? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, everyone is safe to get vaccinated. And one must remember that patients with heart disease and risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity have been shown to have 
you know adverse outcomes and having more chances of having a serious illness if they contract covid and this has been shown to us through multiple studies and that their uh, adverse outcomes are more than 10 times higher than that of the general population so it's very much imperative that uh, patients with heart disease get themselves vaccinated in fact it's one of the main comorbid conditions listed for priority vaccination by our government and by all the other governments across the world all right uh, dr abdul is there any special care that women uh, can take to uh, reduce the risk of uh, contracting coronavirus i must tell you uh, basically fundamentally human behavior and susceptibility to both sexes is the same but we know that uh, women tend to be in touch with uh, many people uh, i can afford to be stuck up to my office and you can afford to be stuck up in your own office and uh, monitor the number of people that are coming in and walking out but if you look at women you know like children going to the school now in many areas getting permitted so they safely go to school and come back do not get infected there and then uh, spread this uh, within the home or domestic help you know they goes for the marketing and uh, uh, 10 things getting done every day that they stick not only that uh, the house lady stays uh, takes care of all the standard operating procedures concerning the covid 19 but this help also does the same can coming in contact with a vegetable vendor getting no some of those scores which made us made us a little bit uncomfortable in the earlier few months of when this covid uh, came that people not being able to get uh, day to day uh, things that we need for our own survival i think that is one area that uh, women need to address to and probably you know the time for those huge uh, social gatherings marriage parties and uh, those kitty parties is not yet around a uh, doctor sandhu also is the vaccination safe for people who have undergone a bypass surgery this is a question we get asked very often i will reiterate that it is safe for everyone to take the vaccination in fact the only um, you know couple of conditions where it's maybe not safe to take the vaccination one is pregnancy because it has not been studied very well in the trials but so far we don't even have any harmful data that if pregnant women get the vaccine would there be any adverse outcome so i feel um, and the other class of people are of course who are immunocompromised like hiv patients or patients with cancer or who are on immunosuppressive drugs even they they should they can take the vaccine the only downside is that their immune response may not be as robust as in the normal people uh, dr abdul uh, one question also about you know how protected you are after getting the vaccine if somebody has received the vaccine and they come into contact with someone who later turns out to have corona virus do they still need to isolate themselves uh, cdc uh, recommends today if somebody is fully vaccinated and he comes in contact with a covid patient he does not need to get quarantined but what is important as uh, dr sandhu just now talked about this person who has been fully vaccinated uh, that would invariably mean all those vaccines why do you need two doses and a spend couple of weeks after the second dose uh, can feel from that point of view quite uh, comfortable but he may continue to harbor the virus but may not develop the over disease so if he harbors that virus he may have the potential of spreading it to others you need to be careful that you do not spread it to others to family members to colleagues so even after that you don't get stuck up for two weeks somewhere but use all those standard uh, methods uh, which uh, we know very well now for more than an year help in retarding the transmission of this virus social distancing masking and keeping your hands clean All right uh, Dr Sandhu another uh, question about uh, you know the vaccine and does the immunity that one gets post uh, contracting the covid infection does that last longer from the protection one gets from the vaccine though i know it's been a short while now that we've had the vaccines in place and of course uh, the covid disease as well uh, well the jury is still out on that and we have seen through our phase 2 and phase 3 clinical trials that people who contracted covid infection and uh, they had their antibody response going up to a period of 6 to 8 months and the vaccine trials have shown us that uh, immunity a robust immune response still remains up to 4 to 5 months after the vaccine
and uh, but the exact uh, duration of the uh, protective immune response which persists we'll only come to know as time goes by and inevitably it leads us to the other question that uh, when would we be getting the booster shots because only once we come to know when the immune response is waning that's the time when we will be getting the booster shots to uh, you know perpetuate the immune response and that could be six monthly or yearly but we'll get to know as more data comes by uh, dr abdul if you come back to the issue of women how are thyroid conditions managed in women thyroid disease are very common obviously not as common as diabetes we have in india and unfortunately most patients with thyroid diseases are not diagnosed well and in time thyroid diseases are far more commoner in women than men if you look at thyroid uh, gland which is situated in front of our neck it produces a hormone known as thyroxin there are two particular types of disorders that may affect it one there might be excess of this hormone which we call as hyperthyroidism where you get uh, weight loss irritability tremors you know, diarrhea uh, but this form of thyroid disease is relatively less common what is common and what we in the common man's language call as thyroid disease is decreased function of this thyroid gland known as hypothyroidism this usually entails some uh, moderate amount of weight gain easy fatigability uh, excess of sleep cold intolerance this is a common form of thyroid disease the problem with this thing it needs to be diagnosed in time treatment is relatively simple given the magnitude of deficiency the doctor titrates the amount of hormone that needs to be given daily and one needs to get tested regularly but here again as we were talking about uh, women and we are talking about pregnancy uh, and in pregnancy a thyroid disease needs to be diagnosed in time because if there is thyroid hormone deficiency that is the potential of impairing the brain development of the child which used to be a huge problem in india so the best thing is that whenever you think of getting into a state of pregnancy apart from getting blood sugars done blood pressure properly taken care of also getting a thyroid function test done uh, that one does not have a hypo function or hyper function of this gland so that the fetal development particularly the brain development occurs adequately all right and uh, dr sandhu we were talking about people's concerns post getting uh, the the vaccine and you know there's been this whole controversy in europe and people now are asking about the clotting of fears after the vaccinations what would you say about that see uh, again uh, we don't have uh, much data but yes uh, there is uh, enough reports for us to uh, get concerned and search for more information uh, some countries have been uh, you know quick to jump the gun and uh, you know ban the astrazeneca vaccine because of these blood clot reports and um, we have had some initial uh, uh, you know studies done that it is a form of heparin induced thrombocytopenia these clots are forming in the people's uh, brains you know the veins which drain the blood from the brains and some cases in the lungs some cases in the stomach and uh, so these blood clots are looking like a syndrome uh, which we already know when we used to have heparin uh, you know being administered for many years it used to cause uh, you know low platelets and thrombosis so currently uh, there are still some studies going on but having said that one must look at the numbers the numbers are so low that they constitute 0.027% of all the patients who are administered the vaccine so currently our focus is to control the pandemic and not worry about this very very low incidence of blood clots and one must continue taking the vaccine all right thank you so much you know for clarifying that and uh, speaking about it extensively and you know pointing out that it's a very minuscule number of such cases that have been reported well thank you so much uh, doctors for joining us on the show and clarifying all these doubts and all these questions that people have and remember uh, the message from the doctors is to go ahead and get the vaccine that's the only way we're going to defeat this pandemic thanks for watching goodbye